Um, well, well, thank you very much, Peter, and thank you very much to the Angus uh, Breed Society for the opportunity to come down here uh, and present to you today. And it's great to see such a such a large audience and large turnout. I was speaking to Peter um, about six weeks ago or so, and he was hoping to get about. He said he'd be really happy if there was about 100 people turn up. So to see 220 odd registered people, uh, that, that's excellent. I'm sure he's extremely happy with that. So today I'm going to go through with you a little bit of a market outlook, a bit of a market update. Um, and, and explain to you where we see things happening in 2016, 2017. And it's on the back of what was probably one of the most remarkable years in the Australian cattle industry. You know, last year we actually sold a record number of cattle. There was a, there was a record number of cattle when you stack together the numbers that were processed to the number of cattle that were live exported. Ten and a half million head of cattle went out of the system. And all at the same time, our, our cattle prices shot up to record highs, right? So that's what we experienced in 2015. I'm going to go through what we're going to experience in 2000, or what we're forecasting to experience in 2016, 17. Before I get into that though, just a quick reminder of who MLA are and what we do. So MLA is the service provider for the Australian red meat industry. So for every $5 that you guys pay as grass-fed levy payers, um, basically $3.66 of that goes towards marketing and Richard Norton's going to be here tomorrow to give you a good overview on some of the marketing campaigns that Australia is doing uh, not only here in the domestic market but also internationally because well we export about 70% of the beef that we produce each year so it's vitally important that we uh, that we keep in, in front of our competitors in, in terms of pushing the messages and those quality attributes that not only Angus beef but Australian beef um, has around the world. The other part of the money, the remainder goes towards research and there's a whole range of different things that we do, um, anything from pasture research, genetic research, MSA, all those sorts of things and then there's the, the market information area which is the area that I, uh, that I fall into and that's exactly what I'll be going through with you today. <clears throat> So as I said, 2015 was just an astonishing year in the Australian cattle industry. It doesn't matter what indicator you look at, it doesn't matter where you look around the country. I've just chosen a selection here. Um, uh, so, so Victoria, New South Wales, Queensland, even feeder cattle up out of, uh, out of the Northern Territory. All of the indicators shot up to record highs in 2015. For 550 kilo C4 um, grass-fed bullocks, you know, on average through the sale yards, you know, you're getting up to about $1,800 a head at times. And again, this is all at the same time as there being rec a record number of cattle uh, on the market in 2015. So for 2016, there's a couple of very strong and different forces that are going to be at play. On the one hand, we're going to see a lot less cattle in this country. Of course, turning off or selling 10 and a half or killing 10 and a half million head of cattle is going to have a big impact on the size of the cattle herd. So that means we're going to have a lot less cattle in this country which would normally support prices. But then putting a bit of downward pressure and capping that potential is going to be higher beef production in America. I mean that's the biggest producer in the world and that's the big reason why our cattle prices shot up to those record highs because they were short uh, on beef during 2014, 2015. And also we're going to see greater market access with the like countries like Brazil. Um, <clears throat> one big factor that's going to be quite positive and, and, and instill a hell of a lot of confidence in, a, in, in many producers is if this three month rainfall outlook does come to fruition. As you can see virtually all of southern Australia is expected to have at least average or above average rainfall. Uh, that's on the back of what's been an extremely long and hot and dry summer uh, for 2015-16 for, uh, for summer. Um, so if this does come into fruition um, and bearing in mind we're going to have a lot less cattle around this certainly will act to support prices and instill a hell of a lot of confidence in the market. Um, looking at the number of cattle available for slaughter uh, and if we have a look at 2014, 2015 really stick out you know back to back years with more than 9 million head of cattle killed even if you have a look at 2013 more than 8 million head of cattle going out of the system you got to go back a hell of a long way before you see a time when this country killed or processed that many cattle in fact you got to go all the way back to the late 1970s and that's when we're in the beef slump the big difference between now and the big difference between back then is that during two th uh, the, the late 1970s, um, cattle prices went to the lowest they have ever been in real terms and they stayed quite low for a number of years too. Thanks to the great market access that Australia has um, and also in part because of just how short America was on beef production in 2014-2015, when we saw these record number of, well, a huge number of cattle come onto the market, uh, our prices thankfully didn't slump. Now this is 
kind of completing the story and adding the, that live export component to it as well. And this is that record turnoff that I was talking about um, with the 1.3, two years in a row with 1.3 million head of cattle going out of this country live. Um, most of them were feeder and slaughter cattle up into Vietnam and Indonesia. I'm sure Sam will probably talk a little bit more about that um, shortly, but then also a fair contingent of breeder cattle up into China um, and uh, Russia and various other countries around the world. Add the two together and we've got back-to-back -back years with about 10.5 million head of cattle coming into the country. Looking forward, looking at 2016, 17 and all the way out to 2020, as you can see, the number of cattle available for our processors, the number of cattle available for our live exporters is going to be a lot less than what it was for the previous two years. So again, that's going to go a long way to supporting prices. Um, if you have a look here, stacking the two together, 2017 in particular is going to be a very tight year. When you combine the two together, there's going to be less than 8 million cattle available for both our processors and our live exporters. Again, if you think about um, the competition between all the parties for that smaller pool of cattle, that's definitely going to support prices. Um, having a little bit of a closer look at the statistics and just looking at the numbers that were going out and specifically at the females, the, the proportion of females that were making up the adult cattle kill. And it follows, it, or as, a, as a market analyst, it's always really exciting to see um, charts that actually are smooth and neat like this. So as you can see in drought periods, um, the female proportion of the adult cattle kill creeps, all, well, creeps above that sort of 49%, edges all the way up to 51%. You can see in 2015, um, the number of females going, getting killed or getting processed um, edged up to near record highs, accounting for about 51% of the cattle killed. It's a bit of, about a five or a six year cycle too. So it is inevitable, and you can see the early parts of 2016, that the female portion of the cattle kill is going to head down, and it's, it's going to keep heading down for the next couple of years. So when you overlay prices, to this same chart, it's the exact inverse, right? So um, for those of you that are statistically minded and don't look, mind looking at a few correlations, if you go before 2014, there's actually a 74% a inverse uh, negative correlation. So basically cow prices do the exact opposite. Um, to, so when you know lower cow slaughter, cow prices go high and vice versa. In 2015, that got completely thrown out the window because of that whole American situation, because of our cattle prices going up to those record highs and just because of how influential that US market was on our, on our beef industry. So just get you to keep that in mind for, for later on in the presentation. Um, at the moment, our cattle, our uh, cow slaughter is going to head down and it will continue to head down to account for probably 44% over the next couple of years, but our cow prices are starting up here. Normally, they would be down here. When we have a look at the size of the cattle herd itself, two years in a row of head killing two 10.5 million head of cattle, either killing or live exporting 10.5 million head of cattle, that's a lot more cattle going out of the system than what there were calves coming through the system. So ultimately the impact on the size of our national herd is for it to drop all the way down to about 26 million head. That's the lowest it's been in about 20 years the lowest the herd has been in 20 years, going from the highest it had been up here with more than 29 million head of cattle in the country, the highest it had been since the late 1970s, all the way down to what's going to be the lowest. And it's going to be that remain around that number for at least the next couple of years. So again, thinking back to the parties that are going to be trying to compete for our cattle, if we think about the feedlots, the live exporters, the processors, the restockers, I mean, there's still 86% of Queensland that's drought declared, and a lot of those producers don't have any cattle anymore. So, you know, once they start to hit the market in full swing, again, we've got a fairly small pool of cattle, um, and, and there's going to be a lot of parties looking to compete for, that, for those cattle. Um, as I said, because cattle slaughter is expected to drop quite significantly this year, in fact, it's estimated to be down about 16 or 17 per cent year on year. Uh, from a processor's point of view, one means or one way of offsetting the decline in the number of cattle available is to do exactly what happened over in America a few years ago, and that is to put more cattle on feed and potentially feed them for a little bit longer, so ultimately make the carcasses heavier. And we're already seeing that in the number of cattle on feed. So um, throughout 2015, uh, the numbers on feed actually shot up to record highs. We saw close to a million head of cattle on feed in Australia towards the end of 2015. Putting that into perspective for you, normally we would only have about 750 to 800,000 head of cattle on feed in this country at any one time. So it went up to around 
uh, a million head. Now our expectations are and our forecasts are that for those numbers of cattle on feed, to they are going to decline because there's a lot less cattle around. But to what point? Well, they're probably not going to go all the way back down to that long-term average of you know 750 to 800,000 head. They're probably going to drift back down to something like 900,000 head. So again, there's going to probably <laughs> there's going to be strong competition and strong demand from those feedlots um, as a means of making the cattle heavier to offset that fall in uh, in cattle slaughter. Um, another huge positive for the Australian red meat industry over the past two years is the, the um, three free trade agreements that have entered into force in, in just that short period of time, in just two years. Why it's exciting is because um, it's Korea, Japan and China, so that's our second, third and fourth largest beef export destinations. Um, in some of those markets, there was, well Korea for example, um, there previously was a 40% tariff placed on Australian beef. That's actually going to go all the way down to 0%, so zero tax placed on Australian beef once it enters that market over the next 15 years. Uh, Japan also declines, it goes from about 38% down to uh, about 20 odd percent and China's going to go from an average of approximately 25% down to down to 0% over the next eight years as well. Now why it's a breakthrough is because, well, it's, a, it's um, reduced tariffs into our second, third and fourth largest export destinations. But in terms of negotiating these free trade agreements, uh, Japan was being negotiated for about 10 or 12 years, Korea was something similar. So for all three of them to have entered into force in such a short period of time certainly is somewhat of a breakthrough. And when we put the value of that, the, the value of those reduced tariffs on Australian beef for the next 20 years, it means it's going to be an extra $20 billion um, available through the supply chain over the, next, uh, over the next 10 years. So again, that's another huge positive uh, for Australian beef producers. Having a look at, very briefly, the types of products that we do export. And as you can see, here, well, basically we export our beef in either the chilled or the frozen format. And as you can see, uh, chilled beef typically holds a, a significant premium over the frozen. So chilled is the black line and green is the, is the frozen product and yellow is, your, is the difference between the two. Um, even though we had all those extra cattle on the market last year, you can see that even that the chilled premium uh, remained. In fact, it even increased to about four dollars over the processed beefs, uh, over the frozen beef. So, you know, as a breed and as a um, as a breed society and as a you know producer trying to target certain markets, I mean, if we can get as much. Um, product in that chilled category. If we can export as much of our product as chilled, look at the premium of that over frozen and if you think about how much more value could come through the supply chain if we can get as much into that category as we possibly can. I'll also point out something that I think is extremely interesting is if you think back to that very first chart that I put up of cattle prices, have a look at the export unit values. They follow exactly the same trend and it just goes to show how influential those global markets are. We, we export 70% of what we produce so it just goes to show how influential um, the, the average price Australia is exporting its beef, its beef for on, on Australian cattle prices. So there's a number of positives. There's a number of huge positives for us as, as beef producers and especially us as premium beef producers. Uh, we've got a lot less cattle available. Um, yeah, we're going to see strong competition between all of the parties. Uh, we've got the free trade agreements. Um, we're se selling large volumes of chilled beef um, and, and we could probably add to that as well. Um, so yeah, so there's a number of huge positives for the Australian beef industry that are definitely going to add support to prices. However, we need to take a step back and have a look at some of the bigger things that are happening that may put a bit of a cap on that price potential or before we get too carried away in thinking that prices are going to skyrocket again. And the first thing that I want to show to you and just to put everything into perspective is that Australia actually only produces about 3% of the world's beef each year. Like I said, we're going to see our cattle herd go from about 29 million head down to 26 million head. What's that going to mean to world beef production? Well, it probably means Australia's um, contribution will go down to about 2.9%. I don't think it's going to have that bigger impact. So two of the big markets that I would like to talk about now in a little bit more detail are these two fellows over here, Brazil and the US. Now the US, like I said, back in 2014-15, they dropped to 20-year low beef production, right? And that's what caused a huge rise in prices. For 2016, their beef production is actually forecast to rise about 4%. Uh, beef production is going to go up to approximately 10 million tonnes. Uh, to put that in perspective, Australia is going to produce about 2.2 million tonnes of beef this year. So unfortunately, the same market that caused global beef prices to really shoot to record highs is now starting to, um, we're going to see a significant rise in, in beef production in uh, this year, in 2016, go up 4%. 
But not only that, we're going to see about a 4% rise in poultry production and also about a 4% rise in pork production too, all on the back of abundant cheap corn supplies in that market at the moment. So just to give you a bit of an indication of the impact of that rise in pro uh, production has had uh, on Australian export prices to America um, this year. Uh, during April, our, our average price of, of, of trimmings to that market um, is now 17% below where it was the same time last year, about 595 cents a kilo, right? So with that higher production, um, with that higher production in the US, that certainly is going to cap that price potential, even though we're going to have a lot less cattle available in this market. The other country too, to keep a very close eye on, and because of just how much beef they do produce each year, is of course Brazil. And, and for a Brazilian beef producer, it's actually quite a rosy outlook. I mean, their beef production is forecast to, to increase about 3% this year as well. Um, their, herd, their herd's about 219 million head. Here in Australia, we've got 26 million head. So a 3% rise for them is enormous um, when you think about their supply base. And they've recently had improved market access as well. So if you look back to 2012, um, Brazil was actually exporting beef to China and Saudi Arabia and a number of other countries, but there was an atypical BSE outbreak. There was, an, uh, there was a BSE case um, found. So they were sh uh, 12 countries shut the door on, on Brazilian beef. Uh, towards the back end of 2015, they were actually allowed back into a few of those countries uh, and two of them, are two of Australia's lar larger export destinations, one being China, the other being Saudi Arabia. And you can see here in the blue bars um, just how much beef Brazil was exporting to China in 2012. It was only quite a small amount. Interestingly, you can see how much uh, went to Hong Kong when they were banned from China. Um, but then when they were allowed back in through the front door to China, uh, you can see that the Brazilians did make quite a bit, quite an inroad in just two or three months' time. Uh, and when you have a look at what the export forecasts are for Brazil in 2016, getting up to about 1.2 million tonnes, that's going to be a lot more than what Australia will export. And a lot of that growth is more than likely going to be beef going up into China. Not only are the Brazilians sort of on that cheaper commodity type um, product, grass uh, cheaper sort of, yeah, secondary cuts and going into uh, price sensitive markets, the Brazilians are doing a lot of work on, on improving their image globally by doing research around sustainable beef production, reducing greenhouse gas emissions and really trying to brute boost that profile globally. So they're certainly a country that we need to be very mindful of uh, and keep a very close eye on over the next few years. They're also knocking on the Americans' door trying to get access uh, up into that market because they know just how lucrative the, the potential is there. So again, just another country that we need to be very mindful of when we're thinking about what that price potential is and before we get too carried away from thinking that cattle prices might find another new high and shoot to record highs again. Um, I think this is close to my final slide. Uh, and the couple of points that I just wanted to, to point out to you here are if you just ignore that red line for one moment and have a look at the two, uh, the green line is US cattle prices and the black line is, is Australian cattle prices and it just goes to show, and they're all converted into Australian cents per kilo so it's the same currency, it just goes to show how closely Australian cattle prices follow those in, in America. You know, all of the big ebbs and flows, um, Australia more or less follows those exact same ones. There is a little bit of variance from time to time and that's largely due to just seasonal differences in each country. But if you have a look at those big you know, macro trends, and this goes back to 2005, I can get it to go all the way back to about 1990 and it follows the exact same thing. It just goes to show how influential the US market is on Australian cattle prices. Um, you can see here there's about a 70, uh, 100 cent price, price difference. Normally it's about a 70 cent difference. So the question is, I suppose, uh, is Australia going to go up again or is America going to come down a little bit further? My th feeling is that because of the growing production in America, not only beef but also the competing proteins, pork and poultry, that that American price will probably come back down. So again, that really acts as that ceiling or capping that price potential for Australia. Have a look at the red line now, which is Brazilian cattle prices, and this is all similar weight range cattle. Um, you can see because of how weak the real is at the moment, because how weak the Brazilian currency is at the moment, their cattle prices uh, you know, are all the way down here. So if you're, if you're a price sensitive market, if you're one of these sort of countries here that Australia also exports to, Middle East and perhaps even China, and you're seeing um, cattle prices at that level compared to what they are in Australia, um, it, it is quite enticing. Um, for some of those price sensitive countries. So again, just something to be, uh, to be very mindful of. So just wrapping all of that up, um, 2016, we're going to see a fairly big step back in, in the number of cattle uh, that are available for processing, live export, feedlotting, 
restocking. There is going to be a lot less available, but it's going to be 2017 where there is particularly tight supplies. That's going to be the year when, um, when there's going to be uh, the greatest scramble, I think, between all of the parties to, to compete for what cattle are available. Um, production's probably going to quick recover quicker this time round than what it did in previous years, and that's all because of there being more than likely a greater number of cattle on feed, so heavier cattle, uh, and also a greater proportion of cattle, lighter northern cattle, getting live exported. Right, and there'll also be there's also going to be a lot less females getting slaughtered, which are typically lighter than males, of course. Um, and if you think about the stocking rates nationally, going from having 29 million head of cattle down to 26 million head of cattle, when we do get a good break, um, that's going to mean that we should see a, a, a fairly significant rise in in our average carcass weights. So beef production this time round will probably be a little bit quicker than what it has been in the past. Exports are going to continue to stretch the domestic market. So because of that breakthrough in free trade agreements, you know, we're going to see continually declining tariffs into our largest export markets. Uh, the Aussie dollar this morning I saw on the news was back down to 72 cents, which is great news for trade. Um, so those few factors are going to continue to make Australian products quite attractive internationally um, and continue to stretch the domestic market of beef. So there are a number of positives uh, for, for Australian cattle prices, um, but we have to keep a very close eye on what that competitor production is doing, especially how much, um, how much American beef production actually does increase and what prices are doing over there, because well, you can see how clearly and closely um, Australia does eventually follow those trends in America and also the inroads that Brazil's making uh, into some of our common export countries like China and Saudi Arabia. So that high base that we're starting from, um, if you go remember back to one of the slides that I was talking about with the, the inverse relationship between female cattle slaughter and cow prices, well, unfortunately, because we are starting from, well, fortunately, I should say, because we are starting from such a high base, that's probably going to limit any further rises, even though we're going to see that decline in, uh, decline in the number of cattle available, that decline in female slaughter, all those sorts of things, because of these couple of other factors, you know, starting from a high base, plus the US market softening, um, it may not, we may not see that normal kick in prices like you normally would when you start to see those significant fall in prices, but uh, in, in, in available supplies. But in saying all that, we're at record highs, we're close to record highs, we're starting from an extremely high base and the market's hardly going to come crashing down uh, anytime soon. Um, so just uh, one final slide, uh, a couple of tools and information that we produce and put out on a regular basis. Um, we've got a, a market information app which is free for you to download off your, on, on your smartphone or um, Android. Um, they just type in MLA market information and it'll come up and uh, it has a whole range of different prices and indicators and uh, you can look at all of our sale yard reports that we do, it even has auctions plus information in there too. Um, we've got a statistics database, so all of the data that I talked about today is actually available um, through our website. Uh, and all you have to do is query and, and, and look for whatever you want. That's also free to download and, and you can access and mine as much as you like. Um, we put out our industry projections on a quarterly basis. They're all available on the MLA website um, and, and are also free for you to subscribe to. That can all be found on the um, just MLA, uh, going to the prices and markets section of the MLA website. Um, and we also have a range of different reports that you can subscribe to, um, so it'll just end up in your in, in your inbox every single week or day, depending on which ones you subscribe to. So all of the different sale yards that we um, that we report, we've got over the hooks indicators, so average prices around all of the country, so you can see what the over the hooks trends are doing relative to the auctions plus trends, relative to the sale yard trends. Um, and, uh, and we've also got a, the, the um, daily e, um, EYCI, so ECI text message, which uh, is also a free one for you to receive. So it just gives you a little bit of a snippet of what the key cattle indicators and key lamb indicators are doing for the day. Um, so if you want to subscribe to any of those things, just send um, nlrs at mla.com.au an email or come and see me afterwards and give me an email address and uh, just let me know what you'd like to subscribe to. Um, again, thank you very much, Peter, and um, to the to the Angus Breed Society for the opportunity to come down here and and, and have a um, have a chat with you today, and uh, and hope you all enjoy the the remainder of the conference. Thank you very much. <laughs>